All right, we are live here right. for the final time. It's the final countdown <laughs> to talk about <laughs> Dead of Bones. And like, actually, I said this in my wrap up because I thought my wrap up would go up before this, which is not what happened. But I was like, we will be doing the Dead of Bones chat. But I was like, probably it'll be like a little bit of Dead of Bones and then like a retrospective of sort of truth. Uh, I feel like that's probably accurate. Hey, Jessica. Hey Megan, Priscilla, hey y'all. So yeah. I thought this was very okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, to be completely honest, like it's been a little while because we read it in December. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I had to look up. I was like, what was this about again? Oh, oh, that's right. That's right. <laughs> it kind of had a weird. Hello. Okay. Um, I feel like it had kind of a weird structure of like how, and I wasn't expecting it to follow this random woman. I don't know. It was okay. <laughs> I mean, it just, I feel like, um, I'm actually planning to do a video about this in general. So spoilers, but, um, prequels as a thing, mm -hmm. I think like nine times out of ten it's a bad idea because mm -hmm. it's like what is the reason for this to exist like why do you feel we need to know this thing that came before does that actually do something for your story um does it actually help or does it is it interesting by itself like what what is the point of this is the only point that's like more yeah <laughs> then it's like that doesn't need to happen then hello mm -hmm. I'm going to get wounded again. <laughs> I mean, this wasn't like a naked empire situation. I didn't read this. No. Oh, I was just like, I what is the point of this? Yeah. Well, and then I was kind of horrified at like the one scene involving like the child. Uh, But yeah, it was just like, I, it was fine. I didn't care that much. And I didn't really see why. Like, it didn't, like, cast new light on what we thought we knew about the events that precede the no. sort of truth, you know? Or about Zed. And it wasn't even from Zed's perspective, which might have been more interesting. Maybe. Um, and I think that's kind of what I was expecting. I but also... Zed's solution. Um, I guess it, the only thing it did for me was like, I guess Richard really is Zed's grandson because like when Zed pulls his, I'm gonna put these divisions in and they can go live their magic list. It's like the the junior version of Richard being like, I'm gonna send them to a literal different universe and do basically what my grandpa did, but like bigger and better. True story. <laughs> I had not thought of that, but yeah. Oh, that's all I thought. I was like, this is the mini version of that. This is the Death Star to Richard's um, Starkiller base. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. I mean, and Zed is like uh, sad in this, I feel like, because read, in it, read uh, oh, okay. you read Dead of Bones first. That's interesting. I don't know if that would make me like it more or less, or if, yeah. I don't know. Oh, the first confessor as a prequel. Oh. That would be about Magnus, uh, Magnus Aris, I'm guessing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was pointless, a uh, bit annoying. <laughs> the lectures we get at the end of the main series. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But like, because yeah, like that's the thing. Like it, it was like more or less harmless, but right. it's like. If you're telling a prequel story, why like, are make you it doing interesting. it? Right, yeah. I think that's the thing. It's like, it wasn't terrible, but it also, I just didn't care that much. <laughs> yeah. I did find the, like, child being brutally murdered scene very disturbing, even if it wasn't really happening, but. Didn't make you like it more or less, just I uh, liked it enough to want to read the rest of the series. Okay, fair okay. enough. Although I does, I mean, I feel like it's written in a way that presupposes that you are familiar with the sort of truth yeah. books. Like it's not designed to be read first. Whereas, yeah. like in the Witcher series, even though that's not the publication order, um, it is good to read The Last Wish first. Mm -hmm. um, and like, I don't know if it's designed that way, but you know, like there is a yeah. sense of like 
uh, it is good to start there, even if it wasn't the first thing he wrote. I don't know what you would get out of this reading it before. The well, other I don't book. know what you get out of this reading it at any point. Because <laughs> 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 uh, the TV. Show. Okay, yeah. I mean, and I love the actor who plays Zed in the TV show. So, like, any opportunity to just like picture him saying these lines, doing these things. That's what I, I mean. Like, okay, to so, like talk about this series in general i mean like when it was good when it was fun was like the first you know the first few books when zed yeah. was like being kind of batshit but endearing when richard was being heroic but kind of like a numb nut when caitlin was being badass um but sometimes yep. fragile like it yep. was great yep. and then it's just like no n- none of them are like that by the end no. zed isn't like this kooky old man that stands naked on a rock richard isn't like the sometimes misguided but ultimately like kind-hearted like you know, yep. blockhead. Yep. <laughs> Kaylin is like not badass at all. It's like, what happened, man? What happened? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, um, yeah. It's interesting. This is yeah. As that is such a trickster. Yeah. Hee-hee. After we yeah. watched the Violet Murder of a Child. Yeah. Um, Although Terry Goodkind in general does that. Like all of his books are like, true. he's a naked man standing on a rock, but also like Richard is being like tortured and like raped. And like there's a lot of like wild combinations of tone in Terry Goodkind. I think this being a short, shorter work, then they're like next to each other more. It whereas stands like out more. Yeah, like Wizard's first rule. If you compare something of how kooky it is with like yeah. how dark it is, you're like, there's there's a lot <laughs> going on. Yeah. Here. Well, and it's not like there aren't abused children in the main series either. So Yeah. Yeah. The um, thing I really didn't like is that Zed never got to talk to his parents again. You know, they had to stop talking to him and they tell him they can talk when it's all over. Hmm just didn't care that much yeah (laughs) like i get what you're getting at and in general that's a thing that would like would bother me i guess or not bother me but like affect me but um yeah and it didn't because like i'm thinking um and uh ladies and gentlemen it's not even been 10 minutes but in joe abercrombie's first (laughs) law um (laughs) because like um I tend to agree with him because I asked him when I interviewed him, I was like, so would you ever write, you know, a prequel in the first law, um, either directly before or like a thousand years before or something like that. And he mm-hmm. was like, why? <laughs> like, why would I do that? He was like, would yeah. it help? Would it make anything more interesting? I don't think so. <laughs> so like, but that being said, he did like, he's a lying liar who lies. He did write prequels because the short story collection in sharp ends includes two prequel stories one that's like a brief you know it but it, like that's the thing it's like a short story yeah. it's not a full novel but right. it's like a little scene of like logan nine fingers before you ever meet him in the first law and a little mm-hmm. scene of glockta before he was captured and tortured yep. and because it wasn't a whole book because i agree with him a whole book about that i don't think would be good or helpful but because yeah. he just did like a single little short story for each of them it did the as much as we would need to see to give us some more insight into who they are as people that does shed new light on how you see them now in the main series. It's not Mm -hmm. just like, okay, so we saw a day in the life beforehand, who cares? It's like, no, I have more context now for the things that go on in this series. And it does paint things in a different light. And it does show me things that complicate matters. And that's, that's what a good prequel is going to do. Um, yeah. I mean, that's for characters. I mean, it could do something similar for, for plot or like what you think you know about the plot of something. When you learn something, you're like actually the motivation for like why this war was begun was different than you ever realized or something like that. But yeah, yeah. this doesn't really do any of those things. Which is so. why like, again, like seeing young Zed, it wasn't like, oh, this sheds new light on like the Zed you think you know. It's like, yeah. no, it's like younger Zed. Okay. Well, and because he's also, it's not like he's a uh, a teenager, right? Like he's already lost his wife. He's already like I. So I. Yeah, just, like, if it was like very like, young Zed, maybe then it'd like, be like I, seeing him when he was basically life. Richard. You know. Yeah. Right. That might have been more interesting. Which I think is what I thought we were getting, and I was like, oh, this is not what I thought. <laughs> Are you reading more sort of truth? I'm not planning on it. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to say never, because I kind of maybe Nikki Chronicles, kind of maybe the first confessor, but not like super soon or anything. Yeah. Uh, If he was, 
he was going to show Richard all about talking on the rock. I don't know. Um, should have at least been mentioned in the main series. It seems like an unresolved detail. I don't know what's happening anymore. But <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was Zed and Addy too, but then I remembered. Like, I did think that, but then I remembered that it was his first rule. They meet for the first time. Like, yeah, I thought it. I thought that. it was Zed and his wife prequel. That's what I thought. I didn't think that, but I think because it's Bones, that's why I thought Addy because she's the Bone Woman. Yeah, or Bone Lady or whatever they yeah. call her. Yeah, <laughs> she's the one with the bones. Yep. Yeah, I don't know. I think. I still really love the first few books of the series. Stone of Tears, top shelf. We'll always love. I feel like that's definitely the highlight, like the best book in the series. Yeah, I think we came to that conclusion several books ago. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) We're like, Stone Um, of Tears, man, that's where it was at. (laughs) It's true. Oh, um, your audio is a bit off. Is this, is anyone else experiencing this? You sound normal to me speak I more can, say uh, super califragilist i mean i can change it so i'm doing my computer audio instead of my headphone audio hold on it sounds normal to me is that any better it sounds different but uh, like in terms of consistent <laughs> clarity it's the same okay 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 hmm. I mean, this also sounds fine, so. Okay. I sound like I did this afternoon. Yeah, I was using this, I think, this afternoon for patron reading sprints, so I don't know. This sounds good, so. (laughs) I can hear you. But yeah. Yeah. Less I. (laughs) I, yeah, I would, I don't think I would read, reread some of the books in the series like some of the later ones i feel like i'm gonna unhaul them and like pretend they don't exist (laughs) yeah it's basically just stone of tears (laughs) and wizard's first role because it's the first one even though it's not that good i mean i do like some of the other ones too i think there are some that i liked better than you did let me actually pull up because i want to look at let's do an overview Actually, I like um, Pillars of Creation a lot. I know you didn't, but I really liked uh, that it one. It was okay. Well, and I liked the uh, the Jack the Ripper one better than you did. Dreffen should have been his gay best friend brother. <laughs> he should have joined the team. Okay. I will okay, well, that. let's just go through. You have your... I would never read these. <laughs> oh, go ahead. Um, it might be fun to do an overview if you pull up your Goodreads series page and we could just talk about like ratings and stuff. My phone is almost out of battery, but we'll do our best. Okay. Um, so you just want me to pull up my Sword of Truth, like the Sword of Truth books? Yeah. And I, literally... As I said, you just want me to pull up sort of truth books. My fingers typed first law. I'm not even kidding. <laughs> I just, I was like, what? No. I think because my brain thought wizard's first rule. But after I type first, my fingers are like law. <laughs> <laughs> Obvious. Obviously. That's funny. You know, my phone auto capitalizes the word first. <laughs> I have to like uncapitalize it on purpose. Oh, that's great. Okay. Um. Oh, but on the phone, is it? This, it's not showing me my ratings. It's showing aggregate ratings. Oh, it might just do it on desktop. Boo. Okay, I'll try to pull it up on my tiny laptop screen. <laughs> I vaguely remember. I think what my ratings were, but I don't know if you want mm-hmm. to start talking about your ratings. Okay, so like Dead of Bones, I think I gave three stars thanks i think i did too yeah and then wizard's first rule was four i liked it not like 
my favorite, but I liked it. Okay, yeah, I can and see then... my ratings on okay. desktop. Cool. Yeah, I gave Dead of Bones three. I gave Wizards First Rule three. Okay. Um, Stone of Tears was four and a half. I gave it five. Okay. I'm assuming yours well, shows up as five, right? You just... N- no, although I might update that. It shows up as four. Because I've gone back and forth on like whether I round up or down. But um, Blood of the Fold, I gave three and a half. I think I just gave it three. Okay. I think Temple of the Winds I like better than you. I gave okay. it four. I gave it three. Yeah. Because I think I, when we talked about Temple of the Winds, I was like, I feel extreme hatred and bafflement at this. <laughs> But I can't deny that it kept my attention the entire time, even the second time through. And that yeah. gets points. <laughs> That's fair. Whereas I actually like Temple of the Winds. It's oh. weird. But I like it. Yes, but then they didn't happen. Yeah. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> Wounding you. <laughs> Sorry, I mean, Kayla. it was my intro to adult fantasy, too, which is why, like, I mean, it same. hurts me to be like, I low-key hate the later books. But also, I remain a Terry Good kind apologist because, again, as we've talked about, the people shitting on him have not read that far in the series. Like the people, mm-hmm. I mean, for the most part, I'm sure there's people who have read the entire series and are like, fuck him. But yeah. for the most part, the hatred that he gets like across the board online where people are like, Terry, good kind, he sucks, are people that either haven't read it at all or have only read like Wizard's First Rule. And it's like, yeah. he does eventually suck. But like, no, but not not you yet. read. No, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Soul of the Fire, I did not like. I gave that one two stars. Um, you read online that book five is where it starts to go off the rails with objectivism. Yeah, that's about right. Yeah, I would say that's accurate. I mean, I think we kind of get... I like... I still like Faith of the Fallen. There is a lot of, like, kind of soapboxing in it. However, it worked for me because of the fantasy world. Yeah. And I just kind of ignored some of it, but yeah. I think oh yeah, what did you give Soul of the Fire? I was like Soul of the Fire, Fire was a that was a two star. I yeah, I did also like give it two stars. Fire. I'm surprised um, you didn't give it one star because I feel like you were more angry about it than me. It's probably like a one and a half if I was looking back, but yeah. Uh, Faith of the Fallen, I gave four though. I gave that three, <laughs> but like it was also like because that had been my favorite before, and I had just like I kind of wish I hadn't reread it because my memories of it were like. This was such, and I mean, like, as we talked about when we talked about Faith of the Fallen, that it was like the right book at the right time for me when I read it. And that will always be true. Like, just because I don't think it's that good upon reflection and reread now, that doesn't change the fact that, like, it was the book I needed to read at that time in my life. So I'll always be glad about that. Um, yeah. Yeah. I get that. Um, yeah. I think. Uh, I gave Pillars four. I gave it three. It was fine. So you like Faith better and I like Pillars I like, better. yes. <laughs> yeah, I like Pillars because it's like we were starting to see how like he didn't know what to do with Richard and Kaylin anymore because like they had leveled up so much that it's like where do you go from there? So like I was like, yeah, tell us a Jensen story. Like, you know, just start telling us different characters. It doesn't have to be about Richard and Kaylin. So like yeah. I wish Pillars of Creation had started a trend, but instead it was just that book. Yeah. Yeah. It was it was all right. I mean, I didn't love it, but definitely my least favorite was Naked Empire. It was a one and a half for me. Yeah, I think my listing here is a two, but I'll probably change it to a one. <laughs> Jesus Christ, Naked Empire was bad. I did not like Naked Empire. <laughs> no one talk about Naked Empire as notorious. <laughs> Even mega fans. <laughs> Yeah. I still, yeah, Naked Empire is not good. That's really Chain good. Fire was better. I just Chain Fire, like, like, I'm mad at because it rekindled some hope. And then yeah. I just, that went nowhere. I gave it three, but it was like a hopeful three. I was like, oh, we're going somewhere. So three. And then it was like two, two. <laughs> I was like, oh. Yeah, I originally oh. gave it four, but I just adjusted it to three and a half because I think that's more real. I think I was just so excited that it was not awful. Naked Empire. <laughs> yeah um so it was like a three and a half and then phantom was a two and confessor was i think three. i was madder about confessor you were madder about confessor i gave confessor like a three it was fine I gave it two. 
Because in addition, like we talked about, in addition to like not being that good an installment, it also is the one that has to wrap up this whole arc of like 10 or 11 books. And yeah. I was like, uh, no. Thank you, Caitlin. Naked Umpire is terrible. <laughs> it's, horrid, really, yeah. it's really, that's the one that made it on my worst books of the year list. See, it couldn't for me because it was a reread and I never put rereads on a uh, list. Yeah, whereas I don't remember actually finishing it so i can count it i definitely finished it i just that's also where i stopped and now on this oh. sort of truth read along reread i was like that's why i stopped yeah. <laughs> this checks out i think going forward i would probably stop at faith of the fallen like i just think everything past that like pillars of creation is okay but i don't care enough to reread it like i feel like every like like, I would just read up through Faith of the Fallen, maybe skip Soul of the Fire because I didn't like it. Just... I think I would just read Wizard's First Roll and Stone of Tears. That's fair. I love Stone of Tears <laughs> so much. I it truly really do. Good. Yeah. That book it's by itself one. makes me, like, want to be like, Terry Goodkind isn't that bad, y'all. <laughs> he wrote Stone of Tears. <laughs> Stone of Tears is wonderful. That's a good one. Yeah. So it was an interesting project. I'm glad we did it, though. I feel like, I don't know, going through and reading everything was an experience. <laughs> it was indeed. And it's, yeah, it is interesting watching him change. Yeah. Over the course of the books. Yeah. He had some good stuff going there for a while, you know. But yeah, it doesn't feel like the same person is writing the later books in the sense of like he no. himself underwent quite a change in his yes. own thinking like it doesn't feel like he was tricking us you know like he always meant to go there and he sucked us in with stone of tears it's like I, he wasn't there when he was writing stone of tears he yeah. changed and then was in the middle of writing a series and like the characters that's they are not the same characters anymore no they legitimately not. are not um, yeah which is unfortunate because I love the characters that they are in the first few books. And so it's sad to see it change where I'm like, no, what are you doing to these characters I love? And it's not a situation um, where it's like, it's painful to see a character that like does change, you know, mm -hmm. like which can happen in an excellent book series, you know, where you're like, oh, they used to be so heroic and, and brave and innocent and kind. And then like life made them gritty and it's so tragic to see that like no we're we're no. not talking about good character work we're talking about the author being like i don't think that way anymore therefore my character doesn't either and it's like yeah what yeah yep 100 percent. yes it does feel like they should have stuck yes. and, yeah finished that storyline yeah and Jigang, oh my god oh like my god. if we could not drag it out for us so if we were long. gonna have one villain for 11 books i would have rather it had been dark and raw yeah. <laughs> then don't read the Richard and Caitlin. <laughs> I mean, I don't plan to. <laughs> yeah. Are they? Are yeah? Because if they're not like these early books, I don't want to. Yeah, maybe the Nikki Chronicles, like I'm, and the First Confessor, like those are. If I was going to read any more in the series, those would probably be the ones I'd be open to. Yeah, because I still like Nikki. Don't like a lot of what he did with Nikki, but I still like Nikki. Yeah. And I would, if they existed, I would read books about Nathan. Yeah. That are like just about Nathan. Yes. So I still like Nathan. <laughs> I like Nathan too. He's the only character I felt that ended the series unscathed, that I was mm -hmm. not soured on him. He didn't, because he also wasn't in it enough to like be ruined by this change of heart. He could just keep yep. being that like trickstery guy over there that you're like what's he up to <laughs> he just yeah. like that was his energy from stone of tears through <laughs> uh, uh confessor yeah um yeah we can talk about I, the tv show yeah i mean i haven't watched it since it came <laughs> out <laughs> like Richard and Caitlin said, you'll just throw books <laughs> oh no <laughs> uh yeah i like the show i don't I, yeah I don't I think like it's, the... like, good television, but I think it's extremely entertaining. Yeah. I I found the books before the show came out, and so when I watched it, I was like, this is not 
Exactly. And I was in a phase at the time where I did not understand that adaptations do not need to be verbatim books. Yeah, I saw the show first and then noticed in the credits, they're like, based on the books by Terry Goodkind. And I was like, oh, snap, I should mm -hmm. I should read that. And then I read Wizard's First Rule and I was like, this is not like the show. <laughs> yeah. Um, yep. But yeah, I think the because I watched the whole show myself, like, um, because like when Netflix um it was just like when netflix was like still mainly dvds and they just had a few things on streaming also and mm -hmm. i was like well legend of the seekers on here and i was like all right and instead of studying i just watched legend of the seeker <laughs> and um yeah i like i just had it was like good escapism it was like fun funny each episode mm -hmm. had like a fun little arc uh you know the characters like i feel like they had the the actors they had on the show like had a good dynamic it was just fun. And then my mm -hmm. roommates and I all like um, watched them together as like, I had like uh, six roommates, like we all shared a, an apartment. And like, that was like a show that we could like routinely sit together to watch. Cause like, you didn't have to pay that close attention. If someone missed an episode, it didn't really matter. So like, we could all kind of like laugh at like the goofier fantasy parts of it. And like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was just like fun. It wasn't like great. And like, this is where like, I know you like Rings of Power, but this is where I'm like, Rings of Power, like, it wasn't even fun. Because I was like, mm -hmm. I can like a bad show if right. it's fun. <laughs> like, I don't need it to be quality. Like, if it's just, like, campy fun or, like, yeah. whatever. Like, I watch CW shows. Like, whatever. Like, so, yeah. Yeah. Because also, Legend of the Seeker well, is not, like, trying to convince you that it's very epic. Like, it's at no, no point being, like, oh, no, this is, like, very serious, dramatic stuff. Like, Legend of the Seeker <laughs> knows what it is. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's trying to be campy. That. Yeah. Exactly. It's cheesy and fun. Yeah. Uh... Yeah. Yeah, I, Caitlin, I was a little bit that way back when it first yes, came out, but I don't... Was it in 2020? I th thought it was 21, but it might have been 20. But it was like when the last couple of years. Oh, for some reason I thought it was. Oh yeah, it is 2020. For some reason I thought it was like longer ago. I don't know why. I, don't know. I remember like when he died. Like, yeah. Man. Yeah. That's where the joke started that his ghost was haunting my apartment. That's right. <laughs> yeah, September 17th, 2020. Man. Terry Lee Goodkind. Was born he did finish his Dahara series, so he didn't need to have Brandon Sanderson finish it for him. <laughs> As if that would have happened. It's true. It was wild that he like kept, and he was 72, so he... You just missed us going over our ratings. Oh, <laughs> sorry, Beth. No, she's talking about, I premiered a short video before this. Like my best sci-fi books of the year. Sorry, Beth. It's not very long. It's like 16 minutes, so you can catch up. Um, yeah. Yeah. I haven't, I, yeah, I don't know that I have a whole lot to say about the show just because I haven't watched it in so many years. So I don't remember that much about it, to be honest. Just that it was like, campy and i was irritated that it wasn't closer to the books at the time but now i probably wouldn't care because they made it like we talk about how the sword of truth books like are kind of adventure of the week but the mm -hmm. show is like truly adventure of the week where like they take a lot of stuff from the books and just create an isolated independent little one episode story about it so that and like anytime like the show avoids richard actually leveling up which is actually a really great idea because then he can continue to have adventure of the week stories. Whereas like in the books, because he becomes so OP, it's like, where do we go from here? So like, right. if I remember, it's been a long time since I watched it, but when they do the stone of tears story where he goes to the palace of the prophets, cause they do have him do that. Um, and like in the book, um, what's her name? The one with the violet eyes. I don't know. <sighs> She like tries remember. to take his power and he's yeah, like letting yeah, yeah. her. Mm -hmm. um, and the then sisters. at the last minute he realizes what's going on and is like, no. 
Um, mm-hmm. But in the show, I think it's Nikki that's doing it, and she does succeed in taking his power. So he like doesn't have those powers anymore for like the rest of the show. So he can just like be the seeker with a sword and like you know like <laughs> just like have fun adventures, and it's yeah. not like OP. So yeah, I, was, I think that's a really good idea. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. honestly, it makes sense. It's evil Nikki. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the guy who played Zed was a lot of fun. And the actress who played Kara was amazing. I loved her. Oh. oh, was he? I didn't know he was the mouth of Sauron. Oh. I mean, it is hard to tell who is under there. Like, I think I'm forgiven for not recognizing him. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Um, it would be fun at some point to go back and rewatch part of the show. I feel like it's, I mean, aside from the fact that the, the Mord Sith are still dominatrixes, it's generally pretty family friendly. Because it it aired on ABC. It. Like, yeah. it didn't at, like, you know, 8 p.m. So it wasn't like an HBO <laughs> right, type of yeah. deal. It's, it's pretty tame. I think it's on Netflix, or like, it used to be anyway. I don't know I mean, if it's that's where I originally is. saw it. I don't know if it still yeah. is. I owned the DVDs. I don't know what happened to them. Wow. So, yeah. Yeah. Well. But yeah. Yeah. Now I want to watch the show. Yeah. <laughs> Each episode opened with like a rehash of like Rich, uh, Zed's voice um, from like the first episode. Like they replayed the same audio track of him speaking from the first episode going, Richard, you are the true seeker. Oh, and like, whoa, that's slash right. And, like, yeah. Music. I yeah. forgot about that. Oh my God. <laughs> it was very corny. <laughs> yeah. And anytime Zed would do magic words, it was like, rah, rah, rah. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> not great. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's and I mean, the very first episode opens like the first thing you see. No, I think the first thing you see is Kaylin riding on a horse. But like after that, the first thing you see is Richard shirtless building a bridge. And you're like, abs. All right, where are we going with this? Legend of the Seeker. Somebody's saying it's like stream. That's so well, it did. It originally aired on ABC. So, I mean, yeah. wouldn't that mean that Disney Plus had it because ABC is owned by Disney? You would think, but who knows? <sighs> yeah, I liked the second season better because it had more of Kara in it. Um, but yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, there's that whole episode where they make Zed dress up as a duchess and they make Kara dress up like a princess and both yeah. Zed and Kara. <laughs> like, and they make um, Richard wear this like bleach blonde wig. So he looks like a complete tool. Oh, it's That's amazing. So yeah. Free with cable TV on ABC. That's not. What if you don't have cable TV? Well, it's annoying. So it's free episodes. Oh, maybe you can just watch it. I don't know. Hmm. There's always a way. Yeah. Wow. 2008 to 2010. Man. Yeah, because I definitely started reading the books like well before it started then. Because, uh, I probably started the books in like, oof, when would it have been? Like 2001, maybe? <laughs> End of an era. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can watch been. it with ads. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, that's okay. Um, it has been an era. But hey, we're moving on with the podcast and reading Witcher. So it'll be fun. Yeah. Yeah, that is pretty good for fantasy at that point. And I mean, like, I think Legend of the Seeker is a lot more fun to watch than, like, Hercules and Xena and Beastmaster, which is, like, <gasps> more in the vein. Xena is great. Well, when the people talk about the Legend of the Seeker show being bad, I'm like, that's because you're thinking of it alongside Game of Thrones and things oh, like that. Yeah. But like that's yeah. not what it is. It's like no. Hercules and Xena and Beastmaster. Like yeah. that's the kind yeah. of show that it is. Well, and speaking of which, it's funny, like on Google when I look it up, it says people also search for Xena, 
Hercules, Merlin, and the Shannara Chronicles. It's, uh, <laughs> it's also funny to be watching Legend of the Seeker because like they shot it in New Zealand. And so mm-hmm. like basically all of the cast that are not the main cast, like all the Daharan soldiers, everyone in the Midlands is is a Kiwi. And they all sound like it. So like all mm-hmm. the Daharans have these like down under <laughs> accents. And it's also funny to me because like Craig Horner is also Australian. Um, the guy oh. playing Richard. But he like... They made him do an American accent, and he said that he was, like, to try to, like, get the accent right, he would emulate Leonardo DiCaprio. And when, as soon as he said that, I was like, that's who you sound like, yeah, when you speak in your American accent. And he's like, Leonardo DiCaprio just, like, really enunciates, and it's, like, really easy to mimic it. Um, but then he also said he was really mad when he, like, not actually mad, but, like, kind of upset when they started shooting. And now he shoots a scene with Craig Parker, who plays... Uh, dark and raw and he gets to keep his british accent and craig mm-hmm. horner was like excuse me why does he get to keep his accent why do i have to be american <laughs> that's funny like i think it would have made sense for him to keep his accent and then have everyone from like westland have like australian accents like yeah that would make yeah. sense it would and oh. i think um tabitha or tabrit bethel who played um, Kara? I think she's also Australian, but they made her do an American accent. Oh, interesting. Wow. Yeah, I never got into Merlin. My roommates in college watched it a lot. I didn't I... either. I watched like an episode and it just didn't. Same. It didn't hook me. No. Didn't have abs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm glad people are excited for The Witcher read along. That'll be fun. I think this is excitement for the show, Bethany, not for our read along. What? I mentioned the read along. <laughs> I thought she meant the read along. Well, I'm excited. I mean, I don't book. want to speak for Priscilla. Perhaps that is what she meant. But it I'm reading that as being excited for the <laughs> show since we're talking about fantasy TV shows. <laughs> Fair enough. Or both. She can be excited for both. <laughs> but, um,. <laughs> Oh, for Merlin? I mean, Legend of the Seeker was wise. It showed me the abs in like the first five minutes. And then never again. That's fine. <laughs> oh, you're not See, excited for it show. was about okay. the read-along. Look at that. Very, very good. Very good. Actually, I was talking to uh, my friend who's just read The Last Wish for the first time. And she has seen the show. Mm-hmm. And um, I was like unventing all my fury. <laughs> That, like, before she had no context for. And me being like, um, yeah, well, they made Geralt not even a character in the show. And they totally changed the dynamic between Geralt and Dandelion and named him Yaskier for some freaking reason. And I was just, like, very upset. And she was like, yeah, no, I mean, now that I've read The Last Wish, yeah, you're right. Like, the show, this is not what Geralt is like. This is not what Dandelion is like. She said she, when she read The Last Wish, that her reaction to Dandelion and... Uh, Geralt was like oh they're like actually friends it's not like yeah this oh, twat yeah. over here that shows up and sometimes annoys him like they're like yeah. actually friends <laughs> yeah 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 which I have read the last wish before just not any of the other ones so yeah. and I mean Geralt I... isn't just like a hot guy with a sword that grunts fuck sometimes like he has a three-dimensional complicated personality and yeah. worldview and all Henry Cavill did was just go like abs Yes. Which is deeply upsetting. I need to do my reread of the book. All right. You just finished Last Wish. Uh, Last Wish is a lot of fun, too. I think, like, even for fun. people that may not like the main series, The Last Wish and Sword of Destiny, because it's so much like fairy tale retellings mm-hmm. in such, like, interesting ways, because it isn't just retelling. I mean, it's doing quite interesting twists on fairy tale. It is. So yeah. I just think it's a ton of fun, even if you're never going to yeah. read the main series. Like, yeah. Yeah, I'm looking forward to my reread, and then we'll do our. When is our our live stream? Is uh, the last Tuesday, which I think the, is the thirty first. Yes, the thirty first. So tune in. <laughs> It'll be fun. Whereas, like the Witcher show, I feel like is like halfway between Legend of the Seeker and Game of Thrones. It's like not at yeah. the premiere level that, like, even mm-hmm. I mean, Rings of Power. I don't think is good writing, but like the production quality is on par yeah. with like Game of Thrones and stuff. And right. Witcher isn't as like totally cheap and crap looking as Legend of the Seeker, but it's not <laughs> like 
HBO. No. Yeah, I mean, I think that's fair. And the writing, I think, is also somewhere between. Like, it's not quite as campy and episodic and dumb as Legend of the Seeker, but it's not like Game of Thrones either. It's in the middle. It's very mid. (laughs) It's mid. (laughs) That's what the young people are saying. Yes. I don't know that we have, like, much else to say about this. I feel like it's kind of... Yeah, we've ranted all there is to rant about what a disappointment Terry Goodkind turned out to be, (laughs) young man. Yes. (sighs) Well, we had a good run. He had a good run. He had a good run. He did. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. That was interesting. I do like doing this stuff, though, because it, like... I'll te- I've tended in the past to put off really long series just because it feels so daunting. Yes. And so, yeah, and so doing a year-long read-along is nice because you can I can actually, like, complete long series this way. Yeah, I feel like it's with long series, if you are not disciplined in, like, trying to read, like, one a month or one every other month and, like, get your way through it, like, it's just not going to happen. Because if you yeah. let any time pass in between, now you're in a place where you might need to reread stuff and it's too long for you to ever do that. And then you're like, that's it. I'm never finishing it because I'm never going to reread all that. <laughs> so if yeah. you don't keep up with it, if you lose momentum, that's it. You're fucked. <laughs> yep. Oh, More so betrayal you know. than disappointment. Yeah. Same. On yeah. board. And then he ruined them. That's kind of how I feel. Yeah. But it's, you know, like, we're getting through a lot of these long series that I've been meaning to read. So, did all the Abercrombie books last year, did a bunch of these good kind books, doing Witcher. It's fun. Well, I'm glad, yeah, it, was an, it is yeah. good to do it with people. It's kind of like a gym buddy, but for yeah. going on a fantasy quest. <laughs> yeah. It's a fellowship of sorts. <laughs> a fellowship. <laughs> Fellowship of the Sword, we were. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's too bad. Because I do think, like, yeah, like I said, with, like, what the show did, like, if he had kept the power levels down and not gotten so crazy, politically speaking, if Mm -hmm. we had maintained, like, episodic adventures like we got in Stone of Tears, and, like, you can have an overarching baddie that takes a few books, but, like, yeah. He yeah. could have maintained, he could have had a lot of stories with these characters yep. if he had not done that. Yep. But he had other priorities. Yeah. So, which is unfortunate. Yeah. It is quite a, a shift. Yeah. And it's kind of sudden. Yeah. Yeah. It is a relief then, though, when you read books like the First Law books, because there are series that go off the rails like this. And then to read a series like First Law, we were like, that's why, like, when A Little Hatred was announced um, and it was coming out, I was like, I mean, I will read it, but like, <laughs> to go back to the world of the First Law, are we sure we have more to say? Are we just going back to the well because the publisher needs something? And you're like, let me do you another Fergus Law. And then I read A Little Hatred and I was like, I'm so, so sorry. This was yeah. Amazing. This is great. <laughs> but I think it's a fair concern, considering mm-hmm. how often that does happen, where it's just like, why are we still going? <laughs> right. Yeah. But without the tattoos. <sighs> yep. But um, has have you read anything Terry Goodkind wrote? that's not sort of truth related at all because he has written things that are not at all related to sort of truth they never looked interesting to me so no fair enough have you no what would you say is your favorite or best long series that you've ever read first law (laughs) (laughs) what does this need to be asked yeah I mean first law is a good one uh I mean, I know it has its issues, but the Chronicles of Narnia holds a place in my heart. Just because I, I grew never, up on it. I only read, like... I definitely read Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And I read The Horse and His Boy. Those mm-hmm. might have been the only ones I read. 
I read all of them many, many times. So. <laughs> to, to stay in your lanes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh. Yeah. What other long Oh, the Murderbot Diaries and the Wayward Children series. series. Those are such short books. Well, the books are are short, but there's a lot of books in them. Like Wayward yeah. Children, there's like nine books. Well, like all of them together is like one sort of truth book. <laughs> well. <laughs> still. <laughs> What's um. up, man? It's different, I think, because I have a lot of nostalgia associated with it because it was my first introduction to fantasy, really. Um, like, I got a cop copies when I, for my seventh birthday, and I reread the hell out of them. Um, but yeah. The Dorini Cycle. Oh, those are good. I haven't read all of them, but I like the ones I've read. I've never I'm even heard to... of that. Oh, they're good by Catherine Kurtz. They're kind of, I think most of them are out of print now, but they're <laughs> like medieval inspired fantasy they were good medieval inspired yeah. fantasy that's not something you see too often but she actually <laughs> was a historian with a degree in medieval history so. that can be good or bad though sometimes someone they having a degree good. in something you're like but that doesn't mean you're good at writing a story you know what i mean yeah no, I'll but just she show off what they know right, right, right no but she actually was like she was genuinely like really good i, I got into some of her books when i was in college they were good for me, um, I also, yeah, I didn't really read series. I mean, I read Nancy Drew when I was a, a kid, and I read probably 50 of those. But it's not like a series. It's like you just like pick another one because right. they're not. It's I mean, it's amazing. This girl's like 20 years old, and she solves like 70 mysteries all at the age of 20 somehow. <laughs> somehow. Yeah. <laughs> she has, I think she has a time turner. I think that's canon. Yeah. I had a lot of like long running series like that that I read. Like the like the historical Christian version of Nancy Drew was the Mandy series. Did anybody else read the Mandy? The historical series? like what is unchristian about Nancy Drew? No, they were actively like she was a Christian and it like had Bible verses in it and stuff. But like she's like actual Nancy Drew books are not like in any way objectionable for no Christian no no. Readers. I just meant that these were like okay. from a Christian publisher. Yeah. Okay. It's just like, it seems they, like why do we need to christianize her she's fine <laughs> like she's it not yeah, yeah yeah well and also it was like historical like they were set in like the late 1800s well i read so the american like... girl books which also wasn't really a series in like yeah. an ongoing sense but yeah, i reread like i loved the samantha christmas one and the kirsten christmas ones like i read mm. the both of those a ton like i reread them yeah i read a lot of the american girl still stuff those were good and uh, Boxcar Children and Babysitters Club and Sweet Valley Twins. Oh, yeah, I read all that stuff. But that was like child, like young childhood. Though. I did read um, Ella Enchanted 16 times. So I was very busy. Didn't have time for anything mm -hmm. else. No. <laughs> I haven't changed. <laughs> Just <laughs> find a thing I like and then reread it, re it to death. <laughs> oh, a yeah. lot of Christian books like that fantasy way yeah i remember there was this series of like christian horror books that i read when i was a teenager and so like each like book would yeah but like the twist was that like everything was actually just demons that they had to like cast out so it would be like there would be like a book in the series where like oh we think there's aliens but it turns out actually the aliens are demons and then there's haunted house one but the ghost is really demons <laughs> like it was like that <laughs> after the fifth one you're like i think i i know where <laughs> like, this I is think, going oh i didn't, know where this didn't is. guess that Woo. demons that was quite a <laughs> twist <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh. All the babysitters. Club. I've never read a single babysitters club book. I did. I liked them. Um, no, but I have read this present darkness. I did read a lot of Frank Peretti. Frank Peretti is somebody said this and I was like, that is exactly it. Frank Peretti was like the Christian Stephen King. Wow. Yeah. It wasn't like goosebumps. No. No, his stuff was like for adults. It was like Stephen King, but Christian. That sounds way more terrifying than Stephen King. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, this present darkness was freaky. I read The Oath, 
which I kind of want to do a reread of because I remember it being terrifying and I bought a copy actually like for super cheap because I kind of want to read it at some point because I remember like staying up to like 4 a.m. to finish it because I was so scared I had to like finish it to see what would happen. Oh, I read um, Lloyd Alexander when I was a kid, but it also wasn't series. But like I read Gypsy Rizka and Time Cat and probably some others. Um, yeah, I didn't really yeah. read series. I did. There's another series I want to reread too that I tracked down copies of. Well, I read a lot of uh, Tamora Pierce, like a lot of her stuff. And I read um, a lot of stuff from, oh God, what's her name? Oh, I did read. Um, did you ever read those books that like, there's not a, I mean, it's a series again in terms of like, there's many of them, but they are not like contiguous. Um, of the like are supposed like diaries but like historical oh girls. yeah I, I kind of got bored with those like I got I encouraged to read them but I was like these are kind of boring I reread the Marie Antoinette one a ton and then mm -hmm. I also read the, a Titanic one and then I read there was one about um, I think an, <laughs> a Chinese girl that was like working on the railroad oh yeah I know I read a bunch of them because they were around, but like... All my friends were reading Animorphs, but I never read those either. Same. They were weird looking, so I never really read them. Um, I read a lot of Tanith Lee. Uh, and yeah, I have Royal Diaries. Yeah. But... Well, there was the Royal Diaries. That's was like Marie Antoinette. But there was also uh... the ones that are like non-royal diaries where there was just like historical yeah. diaries i never read the the royal ones but um the royal like the marie antoinette one had like gilded sprayed pages it was very royal looking yeah i i did however read the princess diaries series <laughs> i did not cool. no but um the clady journals by tanith lee i tracked down copies of because it's another series i kind of want to reread at some point i loved them they were like kind of these weird creepy um YA fantasy books. She, yeah, those were great. Oh, there were these creepy, like, um, mystery kind of uh, ghost stories, but they were not supernatural. Um, <laughs> there was like ghosts in the gallery and peppermints in the parlor. Oh, fun. Um, who wrote those? They were like very, like, sinister with like Dickensian, like, evil adults that are like terrifying these poor children. Oh, yeah, wow. I read Ghost in the Gallery a ton. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <clears throat> Priscilla, I love that you've also tracked down copies of the Clady journals. Would people be in, up for a reread? They're not very, like, a read along. They're, like, not very long books. And I've been wanting to read them. I remember loving them. She writes such, like, weird. Fantasy. Let me see if I can find. Uh, yeah. So this is uh, the first the first book in the series, Wolf Tower. Wolf Tower. Yeah. I like the name. <laughs> yep. Yeah, those were great. That would be fun. No, I always did like fantasy, so. <laughs> I actually didn't. Like, I was reading mainly historical fiction and classics. I read a lot of, like, um, classics that were abridged for kids, too. I read a lot of classics, like, as a teenager. Um, I was very, I was a little snooty about that. But, yeah, like, fantasy, but then classics and Christian romance series. I, like, truly did not read fantasy until I, st until I read the, ter the Sword of Truth books. Wow. Like other than other than Harry Potter, which obviously I read. Yeah, when I was a oh kid. yeah. I read a lot of fantasy, but I didn't read adult fantasy until Sort of Truth. And I think I was like 16 when I read them. I've probably told the story before, but I initially read them because there was this older guy I kind of had a crush on who was really into them. <laughs> like, let me borrow the book, a couple of the books. Uh, Ain't that just the way? Yeah, but the books had much more lasting power than that crush. So, wow, that is a lot of letters. I 
have not heard of this. I haven't either. Legend of Thyla Olin Spiegel. Interesting. Huh. Yeah, I think the only fantasy I read before Sword of Truth was like Harry Potter, obviously. And like I read Gail Carson Levine books. So <laughs> Ella Enchanted, The Two Princesses mm-hmm. of Bomar. She had these like fractured fairy tales that were like super, super short. Um, I read those. But like other than that, I was reading historical fiction. Yeah. It didn't occur to me to read fantasy. Wow. That's interesting. Yeah, no, I've always been I've never been a histor- big historical fiction. Yeah, I was just cl- or or classics. Like in college or mm-hmm. in uh, high school, like if I was reading something that wasn't for class, it was probably a classic. Yeah. So like Jane Eyre, Count of Monte Cristo, Three Musketeers, like stuff like that. Yeah. I read a lot of like female written classics. So a lot of like Bronte Sisters, Jane Austen, Louise May Alcott. Yeah, no, I've always read male writers predominantly. <laughs> <laughs> I did read Jane Eyre. But yeah, I didn't read Jane Austen until college when they like part of wow. one of my classes, Pride and Prejudice was like required reading for one of my classes. Yeah, no, I uh, I liked them. Oh. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> when he was open with Hi, Bethany, I thought this was directed at Bethany. No. And I was like, oh, Bethany, someone wants to tell you about your <laughs> rant review for Babel. <laughs> That's definitely not Bethany. <laughs> uh, yeah, I had a, like, it was fine, and I have criticisms review. <laughs> Yeah. Are you what? I I had a I liked it but have criticisms review of oh, Babel. Babel. I I think I gave it like four stars. It was like that's why I would have guessed hate. for you. Yeah, that, that sounds right. It checks out. Yeah. I am reading a terrible book right now. <laughs> Most people like Babel. Most people like it. So listen. I mean, I liked it. I just... I Most people all... aren't, like, nuts like me about certain things that I'm yeah. like, this makes no sense. Like, <laughs> and as Kyle tells me, you focus on a little thing and it ruins things for you. And you're not wrong about it, but you need, you need to stop letting things ruin things for you. And I'm like, hey. <laughs> He's not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Kyle did... um comment on my Babel review being like I don't think I can continue I, he's like, I don't think I can maintain my four star rating of Babel after watching this and agreeing with everything that you said <laughs> <laughs> I was like see <laughs> oh my gosh <sighs> yeah I wanted it to be a new favorite and it definitely wasn't that like so I also but like I don't know I was like it I didn't it wasn't like actually a situation where like hype ruined it for me because no matter how hyped it was like from the beginning when people mm-hmm. were hyping it, I was like, I have this like sixth sense, spidey sense that I'm like, I don't think I'm going to like it. I was like, I don't know why. I can give you zero reasons for this. The cover is stunning yeah. and I love Dark Christopher, Academia. Christopher, you're right. The character work was not good. Yeah. Yeah. Which is a I, lot of what my video is about. That and the magic system makes no sense, but. I don't care about the magic system, whatever. It's fine. I don't care about you that. You know that like, I care a lot. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. I don't. That doesn't bother me. But like the, honestly, my biggest issue with it was also the character work and the fact that like, I feel like it's trying to make these sort of universal statements through this cast of characters that are like lacking nuance. And so therefore, like it doesn't have the weight behind it. I'm like, part of me is like, if you wrote this in another 10 years, Maybe you'd have more life experience. Or if you wrote it, give, if you, know, you wrote it over ten years, like or the secret history, years. or Jonathan Strange and Mister Norrell, which <laughs> which took a decade to write each of those. It's like it shows. <laughs> yeah, because like I like what it was trying to do, but I just think it needed time. She needed time. I think you and I pretty much feel like the same way about Babel. I just feel more extreme as usual about how. How much I hate what it got wrong. <laughs> Nobody's shocked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, because like there's stuff that you hand wave all the time, like magic systems, and I'm like, right. absolutely not. <laughs> yeah. Whereas like I'm just I'm not like the only time that's gonna bother me is if I'm already having a really bad time with the rest of the book. But like, like that's the as, thing though, because you know? like I mean. I, I'm not going to tell you you're wrong to give it four stars, but I'm about to tell you that you're wrong to give it four stars. <laughs> but like, it's like it, something something has to work for me to forgive something not working. So it's mm-hmm. like if your magic system sucks, then like yeah. I you got to have a really good story, really good characters. If your character work sucks, then you've got to have a really cool world, a really cool plot. Like it has to like you know, it, you know something. And like Babel, yeah. I was like, magic sucks, characters suck plot and pacing pretty terrible i was just like what in here is working okay well (laughs) i'll tell you i'll tell you what carried it for me was the themes and the footnotes (laughs) but like i thought it was such a misuse of footnotes especially when she used footnotes to develop characters when we had character moments in a footnote i was like that's not where that goes like that's not what a footnote is for (laughs) i liked it I, I liked the footnote use. But yeah, I mean, honestly, like those were the things that uh, the Andy, <laughs> Andy Weir, I can rant about. Oh, the pacing does not get better. No. No. The pacing's not great. I get why people love it. I'm like, I, I get what it was trying to do. And I like the project of it. But I just didn't, I thought, I think if my four star is a little generous. It was like a three and a half or four to four but like i still liked it more i don't know but yeah i'm it I was mean, disappointing obviously like i have a like an hour-long video about it going to yeah. like all of the things that bother me but on goodreads i just said like as an essay this is five stars as a novel two stars is generous yeah i mean i don't feel as strongly as you do but like i do think it has problems so yeah I mean, she clearly knows her stuff. The linguistic stuff was interesting. But but it's like, that goes in an essay. Unless there's an actual legitimate reason for this to be here in this novel. Like, you just were like, I know things. And I want to tell you the stuff I know. And it's like, I'm really happy for you. But that's not where this goes. <laughs> there's a reason, a plot reason for this to be here. <laughs> I don't mind that. Like, that. Like, that's how I feel I, about, like, like, magic so. systems and world building all the time. Where yeah. I'm like, I don't need two pages on how the latrines work in your magical world. Because you just want to tell people that you invented a way for this to work in your world. I'm like, I'm really happy yeah. for you. Save that for the appendix. I don't, mm-hmm. this does not go here. <laughs> that's fair. I just wasn't bothered by it. But yeah. Project to good execution. Yeah. Or at the very least, I would say the execution was mid. Yeah. I was sad because I, like, pre-ordered three copies of it and really wanted See, I, like, that's why I was like, I had this spidey sense that I was like, I don't think I'm going to like it. So, like, mm-hmm. I only ordered one copy. It was the Waterstones edition, which doesn't mm-hmm. cost more than a regular edition, but it is a special edition. So I didn't order the regular copy or any other special editions. I just did the Waterstones ones because I was like, if I end up loving it, I do have mm-hmm. one cool edition of it. Right. But I don't think I'm going to like it. <laughs> well, <laughs> there you go. There I go. Yeah. Beth, I have so many problems with Andy Weir, even more than I can talk about right now. But Tara Goodkind, y'all. <laughs> mm-hmm. Terry Goodkind. <laughs> I feel like Terry Goodkind, like, both of us are like, oh, Terry, Grandpa yeah. just went a little off his rocker. It's unfortunate. Yeah. Like, I feel like still quite, quite warmly towards him. I'm just like, oh, Uncle Terry. Got a little nuts there at the end. Yeah. <laughs> Beth, I think you're that. right. I think her next book probably is going to be very much an essay. I'll probably still read it or like listen to the audiobook, but I'm not gonna, you know, because I think it's, I think it's interesting. Like the topic is interesting enough to me that I am curious to see what she has to say about it. But like, I don't know that it. I mean, I frankly wish she would just write nonfiction. She has. <laughs> she wrote a very good essay. I know, but I mean, it books, nonfiction books. Yeah, yeah. And you can write nonfiction in a very engaging and like, you know, very like, it doesn't have to be like a a, a hard read, you know, like you can write a very like chatty, engaging, fun, commercially like um, accessible 
nonfiction. I actually think that would be really interesting if she wrote like commercially accessible nonfiction about the the topics in Babel. Like that would have been really. That's kind of what she wanted to do, and I was like, "Stop pretending this is a novel." (laughs) Mm -hmm. The history of linguistics and colonialism. I mean, that's basically like that's the part that's interesting to me. And I agree. I do agree. Actually, I probably would have loved it if it was an essay instead of. So I said, as an essay, or it's like five stars. Nonfic- but like, like that's a, a different rubric for judging yeah, a novel. <laughs> that's true. Yep. Yeah. 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 A video review of the entire series. Yeah. I have a video what? review or a video that's like a discussion of should you read it and pros and cons of like Terry Goodkind in general. But now having read this far in, it might be interesting to do something. Yeah. I, I guess like- I would just, I would add to the end of that video that like everything I said is true, but also <laughs> it goes off the rails like after yeah. like the first few books. So like I maintain this, but then just like, just stop after like the fourth yeah. one or something. <laughs> yeah. Um, I liked the Poppy War series. I liked the first book in that series and it was a debut and I was like, this is far from perfect, but it's promising. And then I did not like the second and third books. And now I really didn't like Babel and I don't plan to read. <laughs> is Yellow Face? Is that the Yellow Face. Anyway, yeah. It's just like Poppy War. I was like, mm, but this is your first one. So, ho-. and then mm-hmm. it was like, oh no, that's the peak. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so no. <laughs> so yeah, I would say, I would say the first book in the series was my favorite favorite but I did like the entire trilogy um it's just a lot it's a lot to read and then Babel was also like I liked it but I had more problems with it and I want to read Yellow Face we'll see that's also not fantasy like it's not or speculative at all so I mean Babel was hardly speculative and I wish yeah. it just honestly like if she's not going to write nonfiction, which is really what she should do I wish she had just written historical fiction because like her trying to introduce a speculative element that she d- had not thought through and made zero sense. I'm like, mm-hmm. why? Just write historical fiction. That's clearly what you want to do. All of this is basically historical fiction. And then you just like threw in silver magic. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a cool concept. I don't know. I like, I thought the concept was fun, but yeah. Fun is not the word I would use to describe <laughs> Babel. <laughs> yeah Uh, i mean i think the poppy war is another situation where like i don't think she's she's either uninterested in it or she needs to be told she's not good at characters um and like rin did all of her like dynamic character moments dynamic character growth dynamic character changes in the poppy war and after that rin like reached her final form at the end of poppy war and then just stayed like that for the rest of the books and i'm just like that's so uninteresting to me that is true (laughs) <laughs> that that is true <laughs> yeah so like if you're interested in the project of how she's like taken history again and been mm-hmm. like let me like do something with that in this like speculative version of it um because that's i mean she was like what yeah. if mal was a girl so like if right. that's interesting to you like this just like a general history but like if you want to read a story about a character mm-hmm. and about like this interesting magical world and like their journey through it it's not that like it Mm -hmm. is that a bit in poppy war the first book it does have that and that's why i liked poppy war and i was like it's still not like quite there like it's got some pacing issues and it's you know it's not perfect but like quite promising and then it was just like oh no that was the best character stuff that we were ever gonna get out of this whole trilogy yeah uh christopher i agree i agree Mexican Gothic did a better job tackling similar themes. I mean, yeah. Similar to Pavel. Mm-hmm. Not Poppy War. No. So we were just talking about Poppy War. So yeah, yeah. Like, but similar. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, similar to Pavel. Like, what does Mexican Gothic have to do with Poppy War? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. I do not see the connection. <laughs> no. <laughs> <sighs> yeah. I don't know. But I feel like, I mean, if we're going to talk about this, I'm mean, clearly I've made my feelings clear about um, R.F. Kwong's books. Mm-hmm. But I do feel like in general, 
egotism really shows in writing and any time that that starts happening is when i stop liking books and terry goodkind shows like a lot of egotism in his later books and that's when they are not good anymore and like i feel like there's a lot more egotism in Babel than there was in the poppy war and i think it shows and like anytime an author yeah. thinks they're really good as opposed to like trying to be good it suffers you know like, I think Empire of the Vampire is extremely egotistical. Like, I think it, Jay Kristoff comes off very egotistical in how he's written that novel. Whereas, like, my favorites, Neil Gaiman and Joe Abercrombie, like, if you talk to them, like, they are, like, at the top of their game. They could act very egotistically, but both of them are, like, I don't know, like, I write stuff. I hope it's good. Like, mm -hmm. people keep reading what I write. Thankfully, they're not, like, I am a legend. If they were, right. their, their writing would suck. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and I think that's true is it's like, I think some of the best authors keep working at their craft of writing and find places to improve. So, yeah. Anytime yeah. you think you've got it figured out is when you should be worried. <laughs> yeah. It's, well, it's also why like the worst version, because like there are some really great indie published books, but the worst versions of indie published books are from people who like, think they're really doing something <laughs> yeah and i'm like oh this has never been done before <laughs> You're like, mm -mm. either it has for sure or like maybe there's a reason this hasn't been done before <laughs> yeah 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 we see you authors you tell on yourselves in what you write it's yeah it's kind of true that's a big problem that I've had with V.E. Schwab. Like, I feel like she's gotten much more egotistical, and I feel like the books have also gone down in quality as a result. I can see that. Well, I mean, I think it's like people get harder to edit. Um, like somebody else, too, who I think similarly is not getting edited the way she used to, and, <clears throat> and like it shows, is Marissa Meyer. I just I don't know, her, but I'm nodding yeah. like yes. Yeah, <laughs> sure. yeah. Like I really enjoyed the Lunar Chronicles, but those were such big bestsellers that I think they just kind of let her do what she wants to do now, and her stuff is not edited the way it needs to be, and it's just very like eh, it's okay. I feel like that's probably true with Lee Bardugo because like I just read Hellbent and I was like, what? But yeah, I, I also thought you were gonna say Sarah J. Mass. <laughs> <laughs> she, yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> like, I think she also doesn't get edited as much as she Which, did. like, that isn't to say, I feel like there's two different kinds of edited. There's, like, authors yeah. that just, like, nothing gets cut out is one kind of not edited. And then there's, yeah. like, no one's telling them no about, like, yeah. things they want to do in their books. Like, yeah. and those are, like, some authors have two both happening. Some, yeah. I feel like with Sarah J. Mass, it's both. <laughs> but, like, with, like, Ninth House and, uh, or, sorry, Hellbent isn't, like, yeah. a tome. Like, it's the same length as Ninth House. It's not, like, it doesn't feel bloated or anything. It just feels right. like, did you have, like, people that you were bouncing these ideas off of that were, like, actually telling you, like, whether or not this is good? <laughs> like, <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, I think, like, Sarah J. Mass, I still, well, although I will say, like, her last book was kind of disappointing because it didn't give me the things that I most like, I most go to her books for. Like, she has certain things that she can do, and I get why, Leanna, you don't like them, because the things that I like from her are things that I don't think you like in books in general. <laughs> happiness joy joy <laughs> love cozy cozy character moments although are, i do love carry but, on i have exceptions there's an exception to every rule there is there is no but like what i like from her is cozy character moments that have nothing to do with the main plot to be honest um and like her last book didn't give me what i wanted from it but i and i also think she does at least for me like does a good job writing broken characters finding healing like those are the things that I like from her books her books and then when she tries to veer too much into like a lot of action and a lot of well, plot like, I'm like when, it goes um, off the rails it's world like, building okay. is not a strong suit and like I've seen like posts you know where people are like hey comment below your top like favorite authors for world building and anytime I see some like Sarah J Mass, I'm just like you I mean you can like her books whatever live your life but 
world building not is not world, their strong not, suit. No. Like, get out of here. <laughs> not for world building. Jessica, I disagree. I love Silver Flame. It's my f- favorite book from her, but that's okay. We don't have to agree on it. I loved it. it what I've heard cry. about that has convinced me that I should never, ever read you that. You should. She's not. It, no, I mean, it's not your thing at all. Don't read it. You'll be miserable. But I loved it. <laughs> so... <laughs> But yeah, world building is not a strength. Also, action scenes and like heavy plot, not a strength. Um, like, Which, there are like, things. Yeah. I was going to say, like, I mean, I don't disagree. Like, I don't tend to like cozy, warm, happy books because um, I just generally don't. But also, most of the time, cozy, warm, happy, whatever, um, it tends to also rely on humor. And I have a very particular sense of humor, and I don't think most things are funny. And so, like, when it is, like, all oh, these cute character moments and they're, like, bantering, like, I'm just, like, completely, like, unamused. And, like, Carry On works for me because I think it's very funny. Like, it is totally my sense of humor. So it's, like, this cute, romantic, bantery coziness. And I'm, like, this is funny. You know, I like this. You, you know what's interesting is that, like, Carry On was very okay for me because it's not my sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's totally my sense of humor. Yeah. But I think that's true. Is like humor is so subjective, and like there's a lot of the times when I like so things like that you didn't like, like Legends and Lattes. Totally my like it's totally my thing, and it works for me. But yeah, like sense of humor can be so subjective. Whereas Carry On to me was not really funny. Like I was like, oh, okay, I loved it. <laughs> Especially the second one. The I mean, I like the first one, but the I one where I think the, the humor one, but... the humor like peaks in Wayward Son. Oh, it's because like they go to America. And so the, all of the jokes about them being horrified by America, <laughs> so good. I love it so much. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's so funny. Um, what are some fantasy authors you'd recommend one check out? I want to Stone of Tears and Like You. Oh. Well, have you said Joe Abercrombie? I was just like, have I told you the good word? <laughs> <laughs> First law. But it's like, I mean, it's it's always really hard to say because like, yeah. what is it that you look for? What is it that you like in fantasy? Because like, as much as I'm like, First Law is perfection and everyone in the world should read it. I don't actually think everyone in the world should yeah. read it. There's definitely people that I'm like, uh, I love you dearly. You're a great human. Never read First Law. <laughs> you know? It's yeah. definitely not for everyone. Um, yeah, I think it just depends on like what you're what you like from fantasy to be honest because there's a lot of variation um there's basically like i think anytime you come to my channel if i'm gung-ho about something there's exceptions obviously to every role but if i'm gung-ho about something you can bet that whatever else it's got going on it's got good character work because that's like my favorite thing Mm -hmm. Um, whereas like other channels will be like very interested in world building where I'll be like, oh, this had good world building, but that's not like what makes it my favorite. So like. Yeah. Whereas like, I, I think I am. uh, What is first law? Well, do you have an hour? (laughs) Uh, Well, the first law series is by Joe Abercrombie, uh, who styles himself Lord Grimdark. It is a, it's not actually the progenitor of all Grimdark, but like it is pretty uh, OG in the Grimdark space. Um, so the first law trilogy is that where it starts the blade itself before they are hanged and last argument of kings which is a trilogy and then thereafter he wrote more books that take place in the same universe as that original trilogy um and it's like in in essence the original concept for it was like taking ideas that are very traditional like lord of the rings fantasy and doing like the dark mirror version of that where like yeah, let's have a fellowship. Yeah, let's have a quest. Let's have a wizard that's like a mentor. But what if it was awful? What if it was like politically insidious? What if it was like violent? What if your heroes were kind of like over the hill and like... uh, And not really So it's like a lot of dark humor. Dark humor and subverting fantasy tropes. Yeah, a lot of gallows humor. Yeah. And it's very, Um, um, it's extremely character driven. So people who like don't tend to like First Law, it's like, it has a plot and it definitely has a payoff at the end of the trilogy, but it feels very like, what is the point of this? Like, where are we going with this? Cause it's just like a lot of character development and character moments and character introspection and yeah. stuff like that. So like it does have a payoff, but like yeah. if you're, a, like, if you're the kind of person that wants like a really like action packed plot or that you really want a ton of world building, then like first law is probably not for you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's no good guys. Yep. There's just protagonists. <laughs> yeah. 
I, I it's interesting too because like I do like good character work but I think I'm also a big themes reader so like I can excuse a lot if I'm into the way that an author is is like tackling themes I care about um which is not the case for Liana. <laughs> I mean, to me, it's like those themes should be explored through characters encountering things that make them grapple yeah. with those ideas. Yeah. Like if it's just like, I don't know, like I, to me, I'm like, how else do you tackle a theme? <laughs> I mean, there's, well, there's a variety of ways, but yeah, I, I think it just depends. I like, I can sort of, if I love the character work, I can excuse other things. If I'm really into like the way it's exploring themes, I can excuse other things. If I'm really into the world building, I think probably the hardest thing for me is I'm a harder sell on things that are really action driven. I have to really care about what's happening to like something that is really driven by the action, I think. Well, I think that's also, I mean, I've said before, I really hate that modern books that are influenced so much by TV and film do the thing of opening their book the way that a film does on an action scene. Cause I'm like that, like never say never. There are certainly books that pull it off. Um, mm -hmm. Actually the blade itself kind of starts out an action scene, but um, like the action scenes in books, nine times out of 10, the thing that makes you interested in this scene is like what this character is experiencing, like how they're feeling about it and what this means for them. Because like in a movie, you can just get away with a cool visual and it can mean nothing. And you're just like, this is cool to look at. But a book, like you can't do that. Like a scene, an action scene, like it's a it's a rare writer that can just describe action happening and it be like fun because you're like, yeah, if you put this on screen, that'd be fun to look at. But reading about like this exploding here and this hitting this and this over, it's just a list of logistics. And it's like, I don't care about this. If this was a movie, I would love it because I love action movies. But reading about it, it's like, I need to care about this character. And so if yeah. you open up an action scene, I'm like, I don't know who this is. I don't care if they fall off a cliff. Like, I don't, I mean, if you opened a movie like that, I'd be like, oh, wow, that looks so awesome. But a book, I'm like, who cares? <laughs> Yeah, I don't really like action movies very much either. Oh, I, so. I for sure <laughs> I <know>. do. <laughs> which I definitely yeah. feel like, um, yeah, like uh, Red Rising, which I love, and I know you do too. But like, my eyes glaze over whenever there's a space battle. But at the same time, if we ever got a really solid adaptation of Red Rising, I think it would be so awesome to see those space yeah. battles come to life. But in a book, I'm just like, just tell me who died. Like, I don't know what's what I have no idea what you're describing. I'm not visualizing any of this. <laughs> I mean, I do okay with the Red Rising. Some of the battles, I feel that way. I think for me, the the most interesting thing, if you're going to do a battle scene, is the internal experience of a character living through the battle. Like, yeah. like that is interesting. Right, which is why, like, opening on a battle scene is not a good idea, because you're like, who is this? Yeah. <laughs> I don't even know them. <laughs> yeah. Like, why do we care? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, again, like an author can open a book that way if they're able to immediately like get you into this character's headspace and like take you through this traumatic moment. And like, and mm. that's what's like, that's what hooked you. But when they try to hook you with like blood, explosion, running, and you're like, who, what? Like, <laughs> I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> if you can't feel vertigo in a book. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because there's plenty of movies that I like that, like, if that was a book, I'd be like, what a terrible book. Like, Pacific Rim? That should never be a book. But I love Pacific Rim because it's just, like, I... giant robots fighting giant aliens with, like, the best soundtrack of all time. And I'm like, yes! I... <laughs> See, whereas, like, I've never even seen Pacific Rim because I saw the preview and I was like, that does not look like anything I would be interested in. <laughs> Although, I don't... I've told uh, Pierce Brown this, um, and... Luckily, he agrees that that composer is great, but that like the best soundtrack for Red Rising is the soundtrack from Pacific Rim. And I listened to Pacific Rim soundtrack so much while reading Red Rising that when I actually watch the movie Pacific Rim, I'm like, oh, this is the Red Rising music. <laughs> like, it's not even Pacific Rim music to me. Oh, man. That's so funny. Yeah. But yeah, the composer for Pacific Rim was Ramin Jawadi. And that's the same composer that did um, Game of Thrones. Yeah. and clash of the titans and other stuff that i'm blanking on now but like he's every soundtrack he's ever done slaps he's amazing yeah. 
Well, you know who else does, I think, a great... There's a, there's a couple of authors who I think are really good at everything. Like, they do good character work, good world building, um, and good themes and, like, somewhat interesting plots. Like, Robin Hobb, I think, does that. N.K. Jemison does that. Like, I think both of them are just very good at all of it. Yeah. I mean, like, that. I do... That's, I did a live chat with um, Jimmy from the Fantasy Network that's... um. That we were talking about Jobber Crombie, Robin Hobb, and George R. R. Martin, and the kind of Venn diagram of those three, because like all three of them have a ton of crossover. Where like it's pretty likely that if you like the one, you'll like at least one of the other two, um, mm-hmm. because all three of them do really great with characters. All three of them do really good world building. All three of them do really good kind of like grounded historical feeling fantasies. Yeah, um, and like yeah, I feel like. Obviously, you might have a favorite, and it's possible that you could love one and hate the other. But, like, there's just, like, so much about them that I feel like the three of them are, like, on the same page with, like, what is a priority to them when Mm -hmm. they're writing something. And, like, George R. R. Martin is certainly more interested in, like, um, magic and deep lore for his world. Joe Abercrombie doesn't care about that. But Joe Abercrombie is better at character work than George R. R. Martin. So, like, they're not the same. But, like, they do prioritize. And how they write scenes and how they let their plots unfold and how much time and space they give characters to actually, like, feel the things that are happening to them. Like, they they think the same way about how they write. Yeah. I would agree with that. Uh, Yeah. Joe Abercrombie does, like, I mean, he's just in general a history buff. But he does mm-hmm. like American history and American westerns, which is why he wrote a western in the world of the first law. <laughs> yep. <laughs> but yeah, which I think is also not that we're talking about this, but um, not to make a value judgment. But I'm about to make a value judgment. Um, <laughs> I feel like authors who read the genre primarily read the genre that they write in don't write as well mm-hmm. as authors who primarily read something else. And then take those sensibilities into the genre they're writing. So like fantasy writers who primarily just read other fantasy, it feels mm-hmm. like the watered down version because they're inspired by something that's like the same versus yeah. like someone who loves um, science or loves history or loves politics or whatever. They bring just, something like, more interesting into it. Yeah. Yeah. So I feel like, I mean, George R. R. Martin and, um, and Joe Abercrombie are big history buffs. And Pierce Brown is a big like um, politics buff, philosophy buff history yeah. buff like that's what yeah. they're into and so like they're like let me explore that in a speculative environment versus like fantasy primarily people who read fantasy are like just like yeah it's like it's you're in these other writers the ones that read something that's not fantasy are are trying to use fantasy as a tool to like do something interesting that they already have an idea for a concept for versus someone yeah. that's like just just trying to think of a fantasy concept if that makes sense yeah yeah no i hear you i agree Oh, well, I feel like I'm like my energy is like <laughs> it's much later for you. It's like Tipping. it is it's like 1030. <laughs> That's 730 here. So I'm like, yeah. the night's just begun. <laughs> it's just be, it's, it's young, you know. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Time to go watch Pacific Rim. Get hype. There you go. You would hate Pacific Rim. Yeah, I, probably. Okay, but the trailer has has Idris Elba shouting tonight we're canceling the apocalypse like what more do you need i mean i do like idris elba but and I charlie watch- hunnam is in it shirtless you know i'll just watch marvel movies instead. ron perlman is in it as like a shady <laughs> shyster what more do you need uh- Oh, oh yes, boy. George R. R. Martin is like mm-hmm. he is extremely interested in like the War of the Roses and the Tudor history. Henry the Eighth is like something he's very interested in, and like you once you know that, <laughs> and you read mm-hmm. the Song of Ice and Fire books, you're like, oh yeah, <laughs> that's clearly yeah. what you're into. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Whereas, and then like Joe Abercrombie, when he told me that it was after watching all of Shakespeare's histories be played by the same cast like all Mm -hmm. in like two weekends that's when he started writing um the age of madness and that specifically um orso and leo were inspired by hal and hotspur as soon as he said that i was like oh my god that's exactly (laughs) what this is of course that's what this is i love that i have not seen the second one because it didn't have the 
Idris Elba or Charlie Hunnam or Guillermo del Wait, I don't yeah, Guillermo del Toro didn't I don't think he directed the second one. He directed the first one. Yeah. I was like, there's no way that's gonna be as good. Well, in other news, we are now only 25 subscribers away from monetizing our podcast. Do you have champagne ready? <laughs> no. Have to stay up till midnight, Bethany. <laughs> no. I don't think it's going to happen tonight, but it's very exciting. Not with that attitude. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, midnight for me is in like an hour and a half, so. <laughs> enough time to chill a bottle. You gotta have to go buy one. Everything was it's enough time. <laughs> uh, uh, Pierce, Pierce, Pierce as in like, like Pierce your something. ear. Yeah. yeah, Pierce Brown, as in I conveniently have <laughs> Red Rising by Oh, it's too shiny. Here you go, Pierce Brown. Yep. Yes, I, everyone I've talked to is behind me. I have got my Song of Ice and Fire books, my Red Rising books. Um, first law is like you know what i need to be like you this year and start actively trying to interview my favorite authors because like i was i like i started off strong i got to interview um kate elliott this week which was amazing i love her books uh she also is a history buff actually i like her anyway and but i really want to love to interview nk jemison i just don't know if i could like keep it together Oh, I, I love mean, her yeah. so much. Like, I, <laughs> I was convinced die. that I was going to dribble on myself both times that I talked to my favorite authors. <laughs> That's author. probably how I would feel. But I'm like, maybe I should just like try to make it happen, you know? Well, it's also great though because like you, it's very there's very little opportunity to embarrass yourself in an interview because they're doing the talking. So as long as you don't like, <laughs> as, long as long as you don't look good, weird while they're talking, like and like have good questions, yeah. So maybe I'll try. Maybe I'll see if I can make make that happen that would be so exciting if i could like talk to nk jemison we'll see that's the thing though too like uh with not every book that i love is an author that i'd want to talk to you know what i mean yeah so like it happens to like first law is like one of my all-time favorite series and i really wanted to talk to joe abercrombie but like Mm -hmm. it's not just because i love those books so much yeah it's it's like 50 percent that i love those books so much and 50 percent that like i've seen him talk and i know what he's like as a person and like Mm -hmm. he's like somebody that you'd like want to get a beer with like he's just like a very chill person to talk so like i love the king killer chronicle and if someone was like hey would you like to interview him we're offering it to you i'd be like well yes but like i don't really want to interview patrick rothfuss like i don't think i'd like to talk to him (laughs) i don't think that would be that fun yeah i would like to i have met nk jemison and she's really nice and very has this like very calming, welcoming presence. I've met her at a couple of book signings. I would love to talk with her. It'd be great. Yeah, that's what's the best. If it's like an author that you yeah. admire and they are like a personable individual. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's the best. Yeah. We'll see. Maybe I'll get up the gumption hey. to the email worst her that can publicist. happen is they'll say no. It's true. Actually, the worst that can happen is they just don't say anything because yeah. it's more likely that they ghost you. <laughs> <laughs> it's accurate yeah <laughs> uh, but i mean when i asked leo carew for an interview i asked him via instagram and he left me on scene for like over 24 hours and i was like all right well <laughs> and then he yeah. replied was like sure how's next week and i was like <laughs> <laughs> um yeah let me immediately read your new book <laughs> wow it is exciting when Cause like, I was also really excited for the podcast with me and I, uh, cause I asked Olivia Dade, who's one of my favorite romance authors, if she would come on and she was like really excited to do it. Cause she likes her, my content and I was like, Oh my God. Gay. <laughs> so that was exciting. It is fun. Like getting to actually like talk they to authors just you people. love. They are people. I know it's true. It's fun. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Well, it's a new year, so we'll see what we oh, what happens. I'm glad you mentioned Jen K. Jemison, though, because I almost forgot that uh, Curious King is releasing his new, like, special edition, and it's for the fifth season. The pre-order Who, drops on... Um, remember the one King? that did, like, the super special edition first law? Curious King? What is this? Anyway, he's doing 
fifth season now. So like on Sunday at like it's like one p.m. Maya time. I don't. Know, I think four p.m. your time is when the what? like pre-order um, public sale goes live. Oh my goodness! Seriously. Mm-hmm. <sighs> How much do they charge for things? I mean, I just got the like lowest, lowest tier of Blade itself mm-hmm. that he was doing. I think it was like two hundred fifty dollars. Yeah. Hey. Wow. Yeah, it's the it's called Curious King. If you just yeah, Google that in fifth season, no, Priscilla's asking. Oh, if okay, you just okay. Google that, um, it, it should come up. Or if you follow him on Instagram, it's Curious King. Man, it's the Amethyst edition of the fifth season. Oh my goodness gracious! <laughs> I really love that. <laughs> yeah, you're oh. welcome. <laughs> I don't imagine I, having that on your shelf behind you when you interview NK Jemison. Oh my god. The question is gonna be like, can I is it in my budget? I don't know. Oh my god. I would love a fifth season special edition. It's like one of my all-time favorite books. Especially because okay. it's not, I mean, like obviously, like if it's a book I love, I don't care how many special editions there are, but it's especially mm-hmm. exciting about something that doesn't really have doesn't have a it. Lot of like there's editions. yeah. Okay. Thank you. When does Yes, thank you for letting me know. I was unaware. My pleasure. Now Although, you're my competition. <laughs> I will say this. At New York Comic Con, Orbit had a table and I was like, hey, you know what would be great is like special editions of NK Jump, like the Broken Earth trilogy. And they were like, well you know, we can't say anything yet, but we agree with you. Well, so hoping. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. <laughs> like, okay. Here's come on. Hoping. Give it to me. Yeah. yeah. It's it's shameful how little there is for for the for, I mean, for NK Jemison in general, but particularly the Broken Earth. I mean, like the whole trilogy won the Hugo Award. It's like, yes. Come on. What There's other trilogy not- has that honor? And they're just in paperbacks. I mean, I think uh, um, Subterranean did do some limited editions at one point of them, but that's it. Like, it's just paperback copies. So, yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. It's a shame. Because, like, I mean, I will buy every first law copy that there is. But, like, I legitimately have shelves and shelves and shelves of a series of books that's only 10 books. Like, I shouldn't have this many copies. Whereas Fifth Season, or the Broken Earth Trilogy, I have three paperback books. And that's yeah. it. And I there yep. isn't anything else for me to collect. Yeah, I want same. To. And there really should be. Is there a significant anniversary coming up? There might be. I'm wondering if we're getting close to 10 years. Let me see. Like, has it been that long? I guess so. Maybe. I mean, I Maybe before the fifth we'll season. 2015. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we're a couple years out. I do wonder if maybe it, maybe the, it's possible they're planning like a big 10 year anniversary thing. Also, they just finished releasing all the Witcher special editions or like the new hardcover editions. So mm-hmm. like they probably are like, well, once Witcher is done, then the next thing, which isn't necessarily fifth season, but like that was yeah. their big thing right now. And those Witcher hardcovers are... Because, like, also, They're Witcher nice. didn't have any nice copies either until now. Yeah. So, yeah. They are really nice. I've bought myself the first two so far. <laughs> yeah, someone gifted me the first one, but I'll probably, as we go, collect them. Yeah. I mean, when I say bought myself, I mean someone gave me a gift card and I used it to <laughs> purchase them. Yeah, they are yeah. nice. Which is... It's upsetting to me that, like, my favorite cover... Of the new hardcovers for The Witcher is my least favorite book in the mm. whole series. <laughs> the Tower of Swallows <laughs> cover is stunning, but I'm like, Tower yeah. of Swallows was the worst. <laughs> oh man, that's unfortunate. Okay, well, I think I probably should go because I am getting very tired. <laughs> I thought we would rejuvenate you. See, if you had logged off when you first said you were tired, you'd never know about the NK Jump. About the NK Jump, it's true. I am very What other important information will you miss if you leave now? (laughs) (laughs) I need to be well rested. I'm having brunch with Jess Owens tomorrow. And you think Jess would mind if you weren't, like, professionally presentable? No. 
I just would, I would mind if I wasn't awake. Fair enough. But <laughs> you know what they serve that. at brunch? Coffee. This is a good point. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. on that note, then. Terry Goodkind, you're you're a heck of a heck of a dude. I will always be grateful for Gratch. Yes. Leanna Larg Gratch. <laughs> you need to make like a merch thing. Leanna Larg Gratch. Gratch. Yeah. So that okay. only I can wear it. Who else is going to wear Leanna Larg Gratch? <laughs> or maybe, yeah. <laughs> Someone might. <laughs> like people look at that like none of those are words. What does any of that mean? <laughs> Only like the true fans of your channel. <laughs> a truly deep cut. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. Well, oh, all right. On that note, <laughs> on that note, indeed. Thank you to everyone who joined us and was a part of this fellowship. And yes. uh, yeah, we'll catch you for the other things and stuff. <laughs> Good night. Good night. <laughs>